Thanks for tuning in for another session of Back Porch Catechetics. This video reviews Catechism of the Catholic Church 2392-2400. to The in brief sections which review the Sixth Commandment, You Shall Not Commit Adultery. It's quite relevant that at the beginning of the in brief section, the Catechism frames the whole negative, You Shall Not Commit Adultery, with the positive, that love is the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. Love is the fundamental and innate vocation. I think with that in mind, uh, we need to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the order of the Ten Commandments. And of course, uh, well, we know them in their standard catechetical formulation. You know, I am the Lord your God, therefore you shall have no false gods before me. But I am the Lord your God, therefore you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. Well, then we have the reflection on the name of the Lord. Uh, the name of the Lord is holy. God himself is holy. His name is holy. Speech is important. We can speak truth in our language. And then we're told to keep holy the Sabbath, uh, the day of rest, the day on which we worship, that these are holy things, but especially that there's a holy way of marking time. So there's something about existence, which is holy and leads to love, something about truth and speaking truth, which is holy, and something about time, which is holy. Well, those are the three commandments to love God. But, of course, we know that the remaining seven reflect on how we are to love our neighbor. Even within that, honor your father and mother is a positive commandment, and the remaining six are negatives, right? They're prohibitions, you shall not, versus you shall do. And so that sometimes puts the fourth with the first three in, a, in the positive articulation. Now, we get to you shall not kill and you shall not commit adultery. And these are both commandments which are fundamentally aimed at the dignity of, of another human person. And, well, as we quoted from Familiaris Consortio in the Catechism, Love is the fundamental and innate vocation of the human being. This is the heart of the commandments in every sense. Love is the fulfillment of the old law, of the old covenant. To love and to be loved is the desire of every human. This is in the Genesis account. It's in Christ's understanding of the human person in the Incarnation. And Christians understand that this desire extends not simply to one or two people around you in this life, but in fact, to all humans, you shall love your neighbor, and to God, you shall love God. That is, Christianity gives the broadest and deepest understanding of the vocation of the human to love. Now, with that in mind, I think we can see a little bit of the pattern that's unfolding with the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, love God and honor your father and mother. Because it's your father and mother who play a key role in bringing about your life, which is dignified and created in the image of God. And it's your father and mother who teach you first about God. In other words, this fourth commandment is kind of a hinge for the whole law because it's through your parents that uh, God's love is mediated to you or expressed to you in a fundamental way. It's in the family where we first learn that. All right, so this place is a, an, an intense importance or shows the significance of that commandment in Genesis 1. You know, let us create man in our image, male and female, he created them. And then God gives, gives us the command, be fertile, multiply. Uh, that, that parenting and marriage is at the heart of the vocation of being human and is at the heart of the, the covenant and the way it plays out. Right. The natural progression then, I think, starts with a human child, right? Uh, love God, love your mother and father. And it seems to me that the next progression is you shall not kill. Because from the perspective of the child, perhaps violence is something we, we entertain against other children, against our own family, against our neighbors, right? So that prohibition not to kill, I think, makes sense in the fifth place right after the reverencing your parents. And then you shall not commit adultery, which is more a sin that we would commit uh, upon growing up, right? Uh, that there's some sense of maturation. That is, we might be angry before we might be lustful in this directly sexual sense. All right, so that's kind of how I make sense of, of this order here and see a lot of really important things going on in 4, 5, and 6 where we're transitioning from love of God into love of neighbor 
via the family. And these three commandments are, are sort of intensely focused on the family. Well, the sixth commandment directly forbids adultery. And that's important for our consideration. Uh, you know, we need a, a definition of adultery. And it, it's pretty simple and straightforward. But of course, we'll apply the sixth commandment to many other things. So, you know, you shall not commit adultery. And adultery uh, is, well, that's having sexual encounters with another spouse. Now, normally we think of adultery in terms of like two married couples, you know, like neighbors or something. And, and the husband from one couple, um, you know, has sex with the wife from another couple. Right. And, and so if we're thinking of our two couples, then like that's what we think of as adultery. But technically only one needs to be a spouse. And so, you know, for adultery, if you had to map it out, it would technically count if you have, you know, a married man and a married woman and then some unmarried man sleeps with the married woman, you know, that would still be adultery. Right. Uh, because, well, adultery is with someone else's spouse, a spouse who's not your own. When we think about uh, two single people, that's typically called fornication. And that's understood uh, under the Sixth Commandment, you should not commit adultery, to also include you should not commit fornication, even though when we technically define them, uh, they would be different. That is, the concept of adultery is broad enough to assert really in the positive sense that the only appropriate way to express sexuality and intercourse is marriage. And so if we want to state this positively, uh, the idea is that intercourse, oops, this one's not working. The idea is that intercourse really fits only in the context of marriage. And adultery, of course, transgresses marriage, but fornication does as well in the sense that you're trying to give a marital expression outside the marriage. This is also what allows us to include uh, pornography and masturbation under adultery. They also, in essence, transgress marriage. All right, well, we said that the Catechism frames the question of adultery in the Sixth Commandment, you know, in that understanding of the human person that our fundamental vocation is to love, and most of what adultery is defending or the positive articulation of it is about marriage. So let's think of this not in a negative rule, like do not have sex with someone else's spouse, but rather what lies behind the prohibition. And, and, and what lies behind that prohibition is that we're called to love appropriately. Now, appropriate love is chaste. And here we have to think about what chastity means in a technical sense. Uh, so let's think about other ways that we've defined love or that theologians might think about love. You know, Pope Benedict XVI has this recent encyclical, God is Love. Uh, it's often given the, the Latin title, Deus Caritas Est. And in it, uh, he argues that there are two kinds of love, both of which are appropriate to think about divine love and human love, eros and agape. And eros is a love, a dimension which, which reaches up or reaches out to the beautiful. It desires the beautiful. It's ascending love in that sense. And agape is love which already possesses the good and, and wants to give it to the beloved. And in that sense, it's descending love. Now, they're not equal, uh, but they're not opposite. They're complementary in Pope Benedict's understanding. And so both are appropriate expressions of divine love as with the prophets and, and the old law as well as the incarnation, um, you know, God is the, the 
wedding spouse or who are going to have a wedding feast of a lamb, God wants to be betrothed to his ancient people, Israel. The, the idea here is that both the erotic and the agapeic or a full dimension of love fits under chastity, and we need to think about that. This is a, a long-standing Christian teaching, and Catholics continue to maintain it today. Marriage is the only appropriate context in which to express sexuality, which includes the obvious pleasures and obvious possibility of procreation. And so chastity is a virtue which allows us to practice that kind of integration of human sexuality. Now, there are many other theories about human sexuality in our contemporary society, and uh, well, this is not the place perhaps to address all of them, but rather to present kind of what's going on in the mind of the catechism, you know, why adultery would be wrong and what the antidote to adultery would be or what it's trying to defend. And I'm saying it's trying to defend a full sense of chastity, which can include both an ascending erotic love and a descending agapeic love, which has all dimensions of the human person and also all dimensions of divine love. So let's think a little bit more about how chastity integrates sexuality. It's, it's the sense of chastity which is about self-control and balance and alignment that's important here. So let's think you know, about the, the kind of vows that a married couple makes. And uh, well, the, the central word in, in marriage vows in almost every version is I do, right? Uh, and it's easy enough to think about that in terms of two basic parts, the I and the do. And the point is you have to have some control over the I. If you're going to commit yourself to doing, then then you have to be able to marshal all of this I, not just part of the I, but all of you. Which, which person are you committing to the I do? Well, chastity is the virtue that allows you to commit the full I in regards to your masculinity or your femininity. And so chastity is that virtue which integrates sexuality, which integrates masculinity and femininity. And that's what allows you, if you have an integrated self, that's what allows you to commit to the doing, to commit to the other person. This is very important to think of it in these terms, you know, to, to see the virtue here and not just a, a negation of something. This is not a restriction of you. It's not a restriction of your self-expression. It's not a restriction of your personality. Rather, it's the means by which you can learn to express yourself better. And in order to see this, we have to think about learning to play an instrument. Perhaps learning to play a sport or learning to express yourself in any other way, right? You want to express yourself through music. What is it that you need to do? Well, you have to learn. And what you really have to do is, is learn to play. So when I was learning to play guitar back in the third grade, well, I did not get to do other things, right? I, I went to lessons, I think once a week for half an hour, an hour or something like that. And, and then I come home and I'd have to practice virtually every day. My parents gave up a lot of things to drive me there and to pay for the lessons and to pay for the guitar and all the other things that go along in, in learning to play an instrument. There was some sacrifice, but it was not the kind of sacrifice which limited the person. Rather, it's the, it's, it's the sacrifice of learning which allowed me to express myself more properly through playing an instrument, for me, the guitar. So learning to play guitar is not a restriction on my personality. It's actually the means by which I can express myself better. And in fact, those who practice more and have more self-discipline are better at playing guitar. Those who practice a sport more are better at playing the sport. And there's something very similar with our understanding of chastity and sexuality. 
You practice being you, an integrated you, by learning how to express yourself better. But we need to think about what, what kinds of expressions are happening through sexuality in order to understand uh, why Christians are, are defending this. So we got to go back to Genesis in order to get the, the kind of master overview or the big picture for this. Now, Christians simply accept as normative the biology of our bodies and the account of our creation in Genesis. Again, I know that there are alternative theories. This is not a chance to engage those theories directly, but to present what the catechism is, is reviewing in brief. And in that sense, well, it's the basic bits that I think most people understand kind of from the beginning. Uh, God creates a male, God creates a female, and we desire each other. The male and the female are complementary. And this understanding of complementarity between masculine and feminine is in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. But, but think about the second creation account where God creates the Adam, you know, the kind of human claymation figure, and then God says it is not good to be alone. Well, well what's missing? What's not good about being alone? The, the one human is lacking another human. The one human is actually a lacking sexuality. That Adam, that, that claymation, whatever person in the first few verses of Genesis 2, does not have sexuality. He's not spoken of as male or female. What's missing here is the ability to give oneself and to receive another self. So the second creation account explores this, right? Uh, it's not good to be alone. And it's not good to be alone because you must be able to give yourself and receive yourself. And that's really to give and receive in love. Again, love is the fundamental vocation of humans according to the catechism that you, you really want to love and to be loved. All right, so what's the solution to the not good? When are we able to give and receive in love? We're able to give and receive after that deep sleep. And, and so in that sense, it's masculinity and femininity which allow, which are our capacity to give. And that's pretty profound. Uh, I mean, we, we normally think of masculinity and femininity as something quite other than our capacity to love. We normally think of it more or less in terms of plumbing, right? I mean, it's just like, do you have external plumbing or do you have internal plumbing? And sometimes we speak of, you know, sets of emotions or, or personality traits um, that's explored by other people. But, but really, the theological read of this in Genesis is that your masculinity and your femininity are your capacity to love, your capacity to give yourself. That is, it's precisely by being a man or being a woman that you can commit the fullness of the I. And this is why chastity is that central virtue in integrating the human person, integrating our sexuality so that you can commit. You're, you're able to recognize, you know, with Adam rising from the deep sleep, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You know, she should be called woman for, for out of her man she has been taken. We belong together. All right. Now giving and receiving, and giving and receiving in love especially, has rules. Not all gifts are appropriate at all times. I mean, as a simple example, think of like giving a knife to a five-year-old, right? You, you should not give a sharp knife to a five-year-old unsupervised because a five-year-old does not know how to use it and does not have the muscle control to use it well. You shouldn't give a power saw to a seven-year-old, right? Uh, th these are things which should be pretty obviously problematic. They would be bad gifts. But that does not mean that the gift is bad. It's not that knives are bad. It's not that power salts are bad, right? The gift is not bad in, in some objective sense, just that it's not appropriate at this time or in this way. And Genesis makes it clear that the gift of sexuality includes being fertile and multiplying. I mean, the, this is the commandment that God gives to the human couple to start a family. Or to put it another way, the point of sexuality in Genesis 
is to give oneself in such a way that it leads to life. So the point of this is your capacity to love in a way which is life-giving. And so, you know, when you're saying the I do of marriage, you're saying I, I do, I give myself to you in love in a way which gives life. I give myself to you in a way in which I, I want to also receive you in love. And, well, this is why, uh, why chastity is so important for the understanding of the human person and why the sixth commandment forbids sins against chastity, forbids adultery and related sexual expressions. All right, so uh, what does it mean to give life, right? What, what is it that you're, you're doing when you're, when you're doing the I do, right? We're saying now, oh, this means that you want to give life and you want to give it in love. I think there are really two senses that, that that happens. And, you know, one is to the couple that the kind of love, the kind of expression of love you have ought to give life to the couple, right? The two die to self and become one, become something new. But second, you know, it must give life to the next generation, right? Uh, next gen technology, you know, next gen person, right? That this is a life, uh, I mean, a love which is so real that it becomes its own life. Marriage is ordered to the good of the spouses and to procreation. Uh, and so it's really marriage which is the appropriate uh, location or the appropriate relationship in which to express fully masculinity and femininity in that most intimate sexual way, that expression of love, which gives life. There would, of course, be other ways of expressing your masculinity, your femininity, but those cannot transgress marriage. So they, when they transgress marriage, they become adultery. That's what the Sixth Commandment is saying. All right, uh, the ideal then is, is that we would live up to the long-standing sensibility in Genesis, which is the long-standing Christian perspective. Marriage exists between one man and one woman. This should be a stable relationship which lies at the foundation of family, and families there are the building blocks of society. That's the ideal. And adultery transgresses that ideal by destabilizing the family and destabilizing marriage. All right, so if we return to our, our sense of you know, adultery, fornication, pornography, masturbation, these are all things which destabilize marriage. Adultery, destabilizing you know, with another spouse. Fornication by separating what should be an expression of love that gives life from marriage, the context in which you would want to raise children and grow together as spouses. Now, masturbation separates sexuality from giving to another person entirely, right? And so it, it too falls under this because it's a lack of integration of the person ordered towards another person in this appropriate expression of love. And pornography does the same. Pornography separates sexuality uh, not simply from another human person and the human community, but it also has the nasty and damaging effect of reordering the loves and desires, which actually should be aimed at another person and instead aiming them at an image. Uh, all right, so, you know, masturbation separates us from others. Pornography from others, but also actually from the person, from a person, and reorders us to an image. And this reorders us to self. These are just misleading expressions of I do, right? Uh, you, you can't commit fully to an image. You should commit to yourself, but not in this way, because this is not an expression of love, which is leading to deeper unity between two persons, the spouses, or into the next generation. All right. Uh, we we want to call this a, a false love, a stalled love, an unintegrated love uh, is, in effect, what's wrong with all of these or the things which are forbidden under the Sixth Commandment. Now, there's, there's a flip side to this, uh, and that's what we've been talking about, about chastity and integrating the person in the I do. And when we're thinking of integrating the person, 
in in chastity and we're aiming towards I do, then I think this reflection on avoiding adultery actually encourages us to be bold in our sexuality. This is not limiting our sexuality in the same way that guitar lessons don't limit a personality. They actually allow you to express your personality more deeply. So this, this sense of chastity as a virtue applies to the whole person, not simply a limited set of actions and pleasures and commitments and responsibilities that go along with intercourse. But in fact, the Sixth Commandment is inviting us to find ways to interact with other men and women which would support them, which would help them integrate themselves, which would help them become more chaste and help them commit fully when, when appropriate. In other words, the prohibition on committing adultery does tell me something relatively directly not to do. I mean, it is a prohibition. But it also asks me to learn how to engage every other man and every other woman as someone who's fully in the image of God, while I myself am fully in the image of God. <laughs>